successful short sellers actually virtually have legendary status. So believe it or not, since 1992, George Soros has done some other things. Um, but what everyone remembers him for is breaking the pound, as they say, when um, the, the pound was forced out of what was called the ERM back in 1992. So there is sort of a little bit of a mystique about shorting, but at the end of the day, um, it's not really a mysterious process, but we do need to get to grips with it because we need to be able to optimise our returns and we need to do some other things. So here are three of the main things. We use shorting for hedging, we use shorting to decrease the volatility of our returns. What do we mean by that? Well, of course, even though we are living in a mainly expanding GDP environment, um, which causes the stock market to go up on the back of increasing earnings, clearly, even these days, the stock market doesn't go up in a straight line, although, you know, um, things don't go up in a straight line. And when they do come back, Obviously, we want to be able to generate some positive returns in a falling market environment as well. Um, and thirdly, actually, we don't really want to just be putting on decent hedges or mitigating our risk. Ideally, we actually want to be generating absolute profits from our shorts as well. So I'll skip through this pretty quickly because uh, Anton's obviously already been talking about uh, IRAs. In the IRAs, you know better than I do, um, you're not allowed to short. Um, so we had this example earlier on. If you've got a $50,000 long equity portfolio in your IRA, and we're back in 2007, 2008, remember that, when markets used to fall? Um, and it fell fairly precipitously. And that's the other thing about falling markets, they tend to fall much quicker than they actually go up. So very quickly, if you'd had $50,000 exposure, then you could have been sitting on a loss of 50%, obviously $25,000, which means from that point, you need the market to rally 100% just to get back to where you were. So as we've been saying, our solution here is that you need to take control. You need to have a retail brokerage account running next door to your conventional, traditional pension provisions, obviously, which is the RA, the 401k. Um, and initially, what we're talking about here is, at, le at the very least, having the ability to short indices, sector ETFs, um, so that you can hedge your general market, your general industry or sector risk. But also, as I mentioned, with the, the third aim of shorting, we want to generate some absolute returns where we actually make money out of falling stocks. So if you think about last year, for example, the S&P 500 overall actually didn't do anything. However, there was a massive dispersion between the best performing stocks and stocks that got absolutely murdered. And we can all think of some pretty obvious examples of what was going wrong in certain industries and sectors last year and at the beginning of this year. So we need an active approach. We need a retail brokerage account next to our IRA. So not really sure, as I said, there is this kind of mystique um, attached to being good at shorting, um, you know, maybe people who like to short are curmudgeonly miserable people, and maybe that plays against uh, your very positive um, American culture of being optimistic. Um, but sort of that joking aside, the reason, the fundamental reason why it's difficult to find shorts is because, as we've been explaining we tend to live in, a, in a, an expanding, growing GDP environment, which means that companies are increasing their earnings. Therefore, they also have the ability out of those earnings to also pay dividends. Now, dividends in this particular environment and dividend yields are actually um, very important because, of course, with all the financial engineering that's been taking place around the world um, on the back of central bank behavior, there is basically a global hunt on for yield. Um, so if you look at some of the best performing stocks, um, you know, some of the old relationships that we used to think about, uh, trade-offs, say, for example, between cyclical stocks and def defensive stocks, actually what you might class as defensive stocks um, have been amongst the highest performers because of their dividend yields. So this is something that we need to be aware of as well when we're, when we're thinking of shorting. Um, and 
you know, at the end of the day, it's a, it, it's a bit of a truism, but for every buyer, there's a sell, right? So the market needs to have sellers. We need to have shorting. Now, there's nothing mysterious about it. Short sellers have got the same um, aims as uh, long-only people. They want to buy low, sell high. The only difference is they sell first and they buy it back later. That's it. We, go, we use the same fundamental approach um, as we do. We're methodical. We have our top-down and our bottom-up view, and we populate the, our top-down uh, macro at sector industry views with good individual stock ideas on the short side to represent what is just the flip side of going long, right? So, okay, who shorts in the market? Well, we've got market makers and block traders that need to um, generate institutional business, so they might sell short to their institutional clients on a short-term basis in order to provide liquidity. We mentioned earlier on um, arbitrageurs. Um, so has anybody heard of an ADR? Yes. Yeah, it's a US security which represents a foreign stock, right? So the primary listing of the, that stock is actually not the US, it's not going to be a US exchange. Um, but this is a way that you can trade the securities of, of, of a foreign country on a US exchange. Okay, so there are some very minute differentials in the pricing once you've factored in the foreign exchange element, you do, there are sometimes very small, very short-term differences. And one way that you might play that is by going long of the local stock, short the ADR, or vice versa, and you can create an arbitrage situation. So that's another example of where people um, might go short. Clearly, we're talking about ab generating absolute returns. Institutions and individuals who actually want to um, speculate on, on a stock price falling. Um, and long short portfolio managers, so we've mentioned hedge funds um, earlier on. Clearly, the, the big difference between hedge funds, uh, especially on the equity side, and long only traditional pension funds is that a lot of hedge funds, in fact most hedge funds, are long short. So they're not just running uh, on one, in one direction, they are, hence the name, um, they're, past, they're not hedging out all of their risks, but they're basically isolating the risks that they want to take, and they might actually have a market neutral um, approach, they might be agnostic on the sector, but within the sector, the industry, that, that is where they want to isolate their risk, hence they're going short as well as being long. Um, one example might be, which has been a real feature of the last couple of years, is you might have a neutral um, or let's say maybe a broadly positive viewpoint on the US consumer and the retail sector. However, you might have a very different view on which retailers, which types of retailers are going to be benefiting from the environment, the conclusions that you've come to about that environment. You might, for example, be much more bullish on online retailers like Amazon and, and not so positive and in fact downright bearish on traditional kind of bricks and mortar retailers like Macy's is really obvious example, Coles, Nordstrom, etc, etc. Um, this weird thing with, uh, with shorting as well is that sometimes, you know, people who short are kind of accused of being unpatriotic or in some way, you know, sort of more devilish. Um, it's just complete bullshit. So one of the ways that uh, the, um, for example, in Europe, the authorities, the stock market authorities, plus actually the politicians, um, back in 2008, early 2009, they actually were banning shorting of certain shares, obviously, particularly in the, in the finance sector. So they were trying to stop people from um, attacking, in inverted commas, the share prices of banks. It didn't actually stop the prices going down because there are still a load of other people out there who needed to sell stock that weren't shorting it. Um, but there is this kind of uh, sort of attitude that in somehow by shorting we're sort of sinners. It's just absolute bullshit. As I said, you know, everybody needs, every buyer needs a sell. Um, and if you happen to take the viewpoint that 
um, a situation has become ex overextended or actually um, maybe you know some kind of irrational exuberance has taken place for example you know we were talking about the the tech bubble earlier uh, earlier on then shorting is a perfectly justifiable and in fact a sensible approach to take um, so the other the other kind of criticism that I've heard is that uh, the thing with longs is that well you know you know that a long can only go down to zero however with a short a short can go to infinity theoretically absolutely the case however I don't think any of us guys here have actually ever seen a share price go to infinity. We have, however, seen quite a few go to zero. So we're going to revisit an example from earlier on as well. So we're talking about um, a portfolio with maybe $50,000 um, deposited in the margin account. Um, we're taking a long, short approach. So we've got uh, five longs, five shorts. We've levered the $50,000 of capital three times to have a gross portfolio of $150,000. Uh, rather sensibly, we've decided that we're going to have concentration limits on, on the size of our positions. So we're going to um, be exposed maximum 10% of that $150,000 portfolio in one stock, up to $15,000. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, one of our shorts of $15,000 receives a takeover offer at 100% premium. I mean, a anybody watching the market yesterday? Anyone see Twitter? OK, it's not, they haven't announced anything yet. There's no deal on the table. Stock's up 22% on the open and stayed there. Um, and there's not even a deal there. So we'll see how that one develops. But if you're on the wrong end as a short of a takeover deal, and it's not unusual to see 100% takeover premium, Clearly, you've just booked a $15,000 loss. And if, you're, if you've only got $50,000 in your account, $15,000 obviously as a percentage of your $50,000 is a rather large chunk. And if you're aiming to make 15% returns, as we were referring to earlier on, per annum, then it's going to take you quite a long time to make back that loss. So. One of the things that we'll talk about later on is trying to avoid that kind of tail risk. Um, what we're talking about there is, you know, the, the sort of um, the tails of a normal distribution, um, where you don't want to be on the other end of the kind of lottery win, which is the flip side would be if you were long the stock that just received a takeover bid at 100% premium to the market price. Um, you don't want to be on the other side of that, so we'll talk a bit about how to avoid that. Um, but, you know, very, very basically, um, what we're talking about here is trying to identify businesses and companies which have a flaw in their business model, their business plan. Possibly um, there's some kind of uh, technological obsolescence, so I'll mention some examples later on about that sort of thing. Or just a situation where, you know, we know from having consulted lots of research that when you receive a negative um, earnings surprise, that the effect of a negative earnings surprise is actually of a much greater magnitude than the effect of a positive earnings surprise. So that's one thing that you need to bear in mind. The other thing that you need to bear in mind as well is when you look at a company, it's almost um, absolutely unheard of that they only have one profits warning. So if they have one really bad quarter or one really bad six months, it's very difficult to turn that situation around rapidly. So you are very rarely going to have a situation where a company has just one single profits warning. So you can actually even wait for the first profits warning and then jump on the momentum bandwagon and actually make great returns um, essentially making the calculation or the, you know, going with the probability of another at least two or three profits warnings which are going to continue to drive the price um, of that particular company down. Um, another good example is high growth companies. When you've got extremely high earnings growth expectations, um, just watch what the stock market does to that company when it even disappoints slightly. So we're not talking, you know, you could have a company that's, um, that's generating 30, 40% earnings growth 
but it only misses by a couple of percent and see what the stock market does to the P rating, to the multiple. And if you can get on the back of one of those situations, um, then you're going to generate very good, absolute positive returns. There's also, um, because if you think about the way that the, the business and the market is structured, because you have a lot of, lo a lot of assets and capital following long-only strategies, um, how do these guys get paid? Well, part of their remuneration comes from comparing them to their peer group. And as sad as it may be, these guys, are they're basically sheep, and they will all follow each other. So even if they might think that actually this could be a bad quarter, they have an overriding fear that if they are out of the market or underexposed and they're wrong, that they are therefore going to sacrifice some of their positive performance compared to their peer group and that that is more worrying to them and to their bonus at the end of the year than actually calling it right. So if they're right, then okay, they're just in line with, with their peer group. Um, but if if they're wrong, then of course they're going to automatically um, be looking um, not as good on, from a competitive situation um, compared to their peer group. So it's easier for them just to basically stay invested. The other aspect as well, which I, I know that some of you will have come across as well, is how many sell recommendations are there out there that are generated by the investment banks and the brokers? I mean, we all know it's a highly political um, situation. You're not going to be very popular with a company if your equity analyst has got to sell on the company, but your investment banking department is trying to get the rights issue out of them that's coming. So there's a massive um, sort of uh, tendency for, for stocks to be rated buys and holds. Um, and also, actually, you know, research analysts tend to be over-optimistic, which means that that, that means that there is greater potential for us if we find the right situation um, to be on the receiving end of one of those negative surprises, which, as I said earlier on, will have a much greater effect um, on the stock price than maybe a positive surprise. Um, so a few guidelines. At the end of the day, we're traders. We're looking at one to three month time horizons, apart from when we're Gregoire. Um, but generally speaking, for most of the time, we're looking at one to three month time horizons. We're not long only investors. We're not investing over, you know, we're not just st sitting in stocks and positions uh, over multiple year, you know, sort of multi year periods. Now, I mentioned terror risk earlier on. Here's a good tip for you. Basically, especially at the beginning of your trading career, you probably want to concentrate in terms of finding shorts in the large to mega cap space. Um, why? Because, quite frankly, if you've got a small or a mid cap company that's in trouble or losing money, um, it's just, a, it's, it's just a, small, a smaller bite size for someone to come in and put them out of their misery. Now, it could be that they've got some kind of technology, it could be patents, it could be there's just one part of the business which is valuable, um, you know, if we think about Yahoo, for example, um, that, and the rest of the business effectively will just get closed down. Now, um, it's much easier for an acquirer, a potential acquirer, to come in and, you know, pay a smaller um, capital outlay. So basically, try to avoid being sh simply short of small and mid caps, you want to be looking for the large to mega caps. How do we define that? Basically greater than $10 billion in terms of the market cap. Um, the problem is obviously, you know, we've been talking about takeovers. If you are short of a takeover situation, you won't get the opportunity to exercise your stop loss. So you can't sit there and say, well, it's all right, you know, I run half stop loss limits. I'll just close it 10% down. You won't get the opportunity. It will gap up on the open, and that's that. Um, we touched on this as well. In terms of dividend yields, there is a global hunt for yield. Look at where bond yields are around the world. Um, we've actually been talking a lot in the Institute for quite a long time about um, not just zero interest rates, but negative interest rates. So 
It's one aspect that you want to be thinking about. If you short a stock that's got a 4% dividend yield, that's an annualised dividend yield. But basically what that means is if you're short for a quarter, then you need the price to, to fall by 1% just to break even before transaction costs because you're going to end up paying away the dividend. To be a bit more specific in terms of what we're looking at from the, um, the sort of earnings profiles, um, first of all, you don't look at stocks in isolation. You compare them to their peer group, to their industry, to the relevant sector. Ideally, what we're looking for is companies that already have a discounted P rating to their industry, which is basically implying that the market um, is recognising the kind of inferior nature of that company and therefore is not prepared to assign them a premium PE rating. We're looking for negative earnings growth or even better, loss making would be good, but you know, it's difficult to find good shorting candidates in rising GDP environments. So we're looking for at least um, negative earnings growth, so falling earnings for this year and the next. Don't forget, very crucially, the stock market is always forward-looking. We're not interested in what happened yesterday or three months ago. We're looking ahead. So we're looking at falling earnings growth for this year and for next. Um, if Ideally, if we can have a greater fall or a greater loss in the second year, that's even better. And of course, we're looking at the company performing worse than its peer group as well. Almost as good as that is negative earnings growth for both years, but possibly less negative in the second year than in the present year. Um, and again, underperforming its peer group. The next best situation we're looking for after that is flat earnings this year and going negative, or as in growth, uh, is negative for the next year. Um, and again, underperforming its peer group. Now we're sort of getting down really to the bottom of the list here. So, but I'm just for the sake of completeness, I'm just going to give you all of them in sort of least attractive, uh, most attractive order. So we're now getting down the food chain here, really. Um, the next best scenario after that is possibly positive earnings growth in the first period, followed by flat to negative growth in the next period, and also, again, underperforming the peer group. Um, and then, really, we're now scraping the bottom of the barrel here a bit. Um, negative this year, followed by flat to positive next year. This is very tricky, because actually, this could be the opposite to a short, because this could be a recovery situation, a turnaround situation. So if you look at people um, like Warren Buffett, who are classic um, value investors, they're actually looking for these types of candidates all the time, but not to short them, but to actually pick them probably before they've bottomed and be in on the turnaround. Um, and really, you know, this comparison with the relevant industry and sector what you need to understand as well is that if the company or the stocks that you're looking at um, are merely as bad as the average for the industry or the sector, it's probably not worth doing as a short. You're probably much better off just looking at the, the relevant industry ETF. Um, now, a technical note uh, in terms of uh, a resource that we can use. So don't really want to advertise for other people, but I can't avoid it. Uh, shortsqueeze.com. Um, this is something that you can subscribe to very cheaply. Uh, and basically what this shows us is the up-to-date information, which is very helpfully published in the US um, in terms of the, the total number of shares borrowed uh, or sold short, because clearly to short a share, we're basically selling something that we don't own, therefore we have to borrow it. Um, and what shortsqueeze.com does is it, it collects the data relating to short positions in terms of the number of shares, um, and then it compares that to the average daily volume over the previous three months. You can also have a look at it versus the stock free float. So what's the free float refer to? Sorry? 
Exactly, the shares that we can actually trade. So if you have a company, let's say you could have a company that's got a, a market cap of uh, $11 billion, but it's got a controlling shareholder that maybe controls it through some super voting shares. Um, they only own 25% of the capital, but they've got over 50% of the votes because they've got a different class of share. Then we need to understand that the liquidity is not maybe what we thought it was going to be because those shares are basically taken out of the trading volume. Okay? So we want to understand this relationship between the number of shares borrowed, the number of shares that are traded on, a, on an average daily basis, and also the, the free floats, so the, num the amount of shares that are actually tradable by the public. Um, why are we looking at that? Because if the um, amount of stock borrowed is um, of, let's say, an elevated level, now I know the next question that's coming, um, then that could potentially mean that we're going to get a short squeeze on the stock. Um, which, as was mentioned earlier on, is, has got nothing to do with the fundamentals of the, of the company, but it's because we've got maybe a consensual short situation where there are a lot of shares on borrow relative to the average daily volume. Some bears or shorts decide to head for the door. They may be locking in profits. There may have been a, um, an item of news flow, whatever the reason, but then the stock starts to pick up, the volume starts to pick up, the other people who are short of it obviously start taking note because the p and is moving. Before you know it, you've got what's called a short squeeze. So this is what we're trying to guard against. That actually, once it's happened, of course, can be an opportunity. But we don't want to be the wrong side of a short squeeze. Um, and, you know, so people will often say, well, what's the optimal uh, number of days to cover? The answer is, we can't give you a straightforward answer, but one thing that you can do is, you know, if it starts getting into the weeks, so clearly there's five business days um, in a week, um, and if you've got sort of 20 days um, of volume to cover in terms of st stock being borrowed, clearly that's four weeks worth of volume, and that's assuming that all the volume is done by the people who are short, which is of course completely unrealistic. So that gives you an idea. Now that's not a magic number, but you know, if you start getting into the numbers of weeks of um, short interest rather than days to cover, then you're getting into a uh, sort of elevated situation. The other thing to, to compare it to is, if you look at the, um, these, uh, this is not the only source actually, but, um, but on short squeeze you can actually see the history of the short interest. So it's actually quite useful to see what's been going on because you might look at the situation and think, well, that's an elevated situation. However, actually, it's now half what it was two weeks ago. So the short interest has actually been coming down. So that's why we can't just give you a bullet, you know, 14 days of um, short interest equals buy short back. Okay, so in terms of specifically um, what type of uh, candidates are we looking for? Um, well, you know, there's the plain old-fashioned fraud. So, kind of thinking Tyco, Valiant, that sort of situation. Um, basically, where the management has essentially misled the market. Um, you know, Valiant was something that you didn't have to be a forensic um, accountant or the sort of uh, stock specialist in the equity department at um, Investment Bank A to get on the bandwagon here because there was ample opportunity once the issue started to emerge to actually just get on the back of a momentum trade here. Um, so it's not like basically that stock opened down after some information emerged and that was that. You know, the story developed and obviously the story hasn't ended yet over a quite a, an extended period of time. Um, and, you know, the golden rule really with the stock market is it, the stock market will always shoot first, ask questions later. So it's a bit like the, um, the sort of uh, profits warning example. There's never going to be just one profits warning. And equally, just because you missed the first move down on something like that doesn't mean that there's not an awful lot to be gained from still shorting it. Um, you know, one of the obvious examples uh, of 
a bubble or an inflation situation is the, uh, the dot-com boom um, at the end of the 90s. It, it's quite amazing. If, you, if, you, if you're around for long enough, you watch human beings making the same mistakes over and over again. So the words that you should be most fearful of in an investment environment are, this time it's different. It's not. It's always the same. There might be a different cause, it might be a different bubble, but bubbles will always occur in whatever asset class, in whichever sector. It's not the same reason. You know, obviously, last time round, it was uh, subprime. Uh, before that, we had the, um, the dot-com boom. But bubbles will emerge. It's just human nature. So these are the kind of situations that we're looking out for as well. Now, I mentioned earlier on the online retail versus bricks and mortar retail example. What I'm referring to there is sec secular trends. So trying to work out industries and, and companies which are affected by secular trends. So that's an example. Um, another example would be, for example, when Apple comes along with the iPhone. Who was their biggest competitor at the time? Blackberry. Yep, Blackberry. Uh, who's got Blackberries these days? Yeah, it's kind of like a retro investment. Um, so, you know, when you've got some kind of technological um, change, then, you know, that can um, really reap rewards. Um, also, when I wrote this, I was at this, this part about insiders and how they treat their company. It kind of took me back to reading Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. Don't know if any of you have ever read that. Um, I would advise it. It's a really good book. It gets a bit monotonous, but, um, and he does labor the point, but it's a great read. And there's a, there's a part of it where he talks about, this is Jesse Livermore, the, uh, the trader. And he makes a point of visiting corporate headquarters of companies that he's thinking about investing in. And if he goes into that company's headquarters and they've got expensive stationery and nice artworks and the CEO sits in a great big fat leather chair with a massive desk but nothing on it, he goes out and shorts that stock. So how does the company, how does the company management treat its shareholders? How does it treat its providers of capital? So you see this a lot in the natural resources space, the junior natural resources space. They're called lifestyle companies. I've seen it time and time again. I've made those mistakes myself where basically the management see the company as their kind of their piggy bank. These things, they're really obvious. You just have to look for them. And then there's another situation which, uh, I mean, Jim Chanos is a very famous, uh, we'll call him a short investor over here. I think his argument, um, it's obviously a lot more complicated, but if you want to sort of put it in a nutshell, um, his argument re Tesla and Solar City is that basically these companies will always have a gluttonous appetite for cash. They are going to continuously, in his view, be coming back to the market to raise capital. These are potentially good shorting opportunities. So you live in a great environment here where you have lots of information that's freely available to you. So you can look at the SEC filings, you can look at the 10Qs, the 10Ks, the proxies, and you can get an incredible amount of information out of those. Yes, a lot of it's boring. Yes, it's labor intensive. But hard, uh, sh shorts are hard to find. The other thing that we've already touched upon as well is obviously trading patterns, short interest, volumes, and price action. So this is more from the technical side of things. We're looking for elevated um, short interest, as potentially an indicator of maybe a short that's a consensual situation, so kind of beware. And that goes hand in hand also with the trading volumes and the price action. So in terms of you know, the types of situations, um, in summary, we're looking at potentially fraudulent situations, straightforward earnings disappointment situations, overhyped stocks, um, industries or sectors with, um, should we say, secular 
trends that are taking place. So they've got the macroeconomics is against them. And then situations where uh, companies are basically having issues with their working capital. They're finding it hard to shift their stock, which leads to high inventories. And we can look at that not on an isolated basis, but we want to compare that to their history and compared to their revenues and sales. And in all of those examples, what we're always looking for, and actually this is true of longs as well, we're always looking as traders, we want catalysts. We want something that's going to cause the share price to go in our favour. So we can't always identify them. It's, it's not easy, but we want to try to think about, well, what is the catalyst going to be here? Is this company about to announce um, a profits warning? Is there some other kind of negative information that we think on a probability adjusted basis could emerge in the next three months which will get the share price going in the way that we need it to go? As I've said as well, we want to try and avoid consensus short situations where there are high levels of short interest. Um, unless it does work sometimes, you know, so for example, great trade back in, even though, you know, virtually everybody did it, Great trade back in, uh, in 2000 and when did Northern Rock go on? Was it 07 or 08? 07, yeah. I mean, we all knew what was going to happen and you got days where basically the stock price became an options price. So you knew there would be days where you got the proverbials squeezed. But we also knew the whole, th it, you know, the thing was going to go. So in those kind of situations, you know, that's the same, it's the same with research in motion, um, with the BlackBerry to a certain extent, Bears, Lehman Brothers. Um, in those situations, they were consensus shorts because they were very obvious. But you just had to be aware that because of that, you were going to suffer days where it would go against you quite painfully, which means that you need to size the situation properly. You also need to get your timing um, pretty spot on in terms of when you actually initiate the situation. Um, and if we think about industry obsolescence, so this is sort of the, the BlackBerry point, it really is basically, it's just the opposite of a concept stock. So there's nothing, although it's harder to find good short ideas because of the expanding GDP situation, concept, conceptually there isn't anything that we're doing that's different to, to the way that we look at the world from a long perspective. It's just we're flipping it around. It's just like looking in the mirror. It's like being ambidextrous. OK, you know, another good example. So we think about uh, last year. S&P was, was basically flat on the year. However, if you got in early on the oil price plunge, obviously there were fantastic returns to be made from the shorting perspective. But try and think laterally. Try and think a bit outside the box to coin a very, very corny phrase. Don't just think about the oil and gas companies, the, um, the service providers, or the pipe um, providers, or the, you know, the people who rent the rigs, or whoever it is. Also think about you know, a great trade was who's exposed to lending to these companies. That was one of the big fears at the beginning of this year, end of last year, beginning of this year. Who in the finance sector, the finance sector, not the oil and gas sector, is exposed to these guys? When they start to go under because of where the oil price is, how do we extend the chain? And this is how we, this is how we find some smart ideas. A um, little bit on things to try to avoid. You know, this is true of whether we're looking at the long side or the short side. You've got to do your work. There's no way around it. You've got to do your work. Don't just piggyback on somebody else's idea because what will happen is that you'll have no conviction with that situation, with your position. And as soon as it goes against you, which it will, unless your timing is perfect, and believe me, any trader who tells you that they're perfect at timing is a liar. Most of us, um, if we buy the bottom or sell the top, it's, uh, as we used to say, it's better lucky than clever. So um, inevitably, you will be faced with, initially, positions that are losing before they make. Now, if, you've got, if you haven't done the work and you've got low conviction, you'll close that trade. So you need to do the work, and you need to not just piggyback of other people's ideas. Um, this, is a t this is a difficult situation 
to identify, and this comes with experience really, understanding the difference between management teams and who has an impressive management team and who's got a pretty average management team. Um, because you can have situations where um, a company is just exposed to a temporary or you know, a short-term um, negative situation which is maybe affecting the, in the entire sector. However, if it's a good management team, they will find a, a solution because they understand their business and they know what to do about it. So again, you, know, you, you, you can't just look at the numbers, you've got to be able to understand, which comes to experience. Um, you've got to understand the difference between a good management and an average or a bad management. Um, in terms of just trading, uh, it's basic human nature. We've seen it time and time again in the professional world, let alone in the retail world. The natural human nature is to basically run losers for too long and cut winners too early. Um, very simple way around that. We have hard stop loss limits for our losers and we've got rolling stop losses for our winners. So we kind of take the emotion out of it completely. In terms of timing, timing is very difficult, especially when you've got you know, an upward trending market. One approach we can take is, as I described with the Valiant situation, wait for the, the situation to break, wait for it to crack, and then jump on the momentum. Another way of doing it is we can begin with smaller positions, what we call startup positions, and then once we've got our catalyst, which maybe we hadn't identified or we didn't know when it was going to come, but then the catalyst arrives and the momentum begins, we can then size up the position. Uh, because the problem is that if we take a full size uh, short, a short position, before the, position uh, before the situation develops, then we can end up being short term, maybe on the wrong end of the technicals, but actually uh, medium to longer term, fundamentally, we're absolutely correct. But because we put on a full position, we've really got nowhere to go. So just in closing, um, obviously we've hammered this point to you. Um, you cannot short in an IRA. You need a retail brokerage account to do that. You need to consider shorting. You need to be able to do it because it takes down volatility of returns. If you're good at it, it actually increases your returns. And it's absolutely indispensable to running a sensible risk-adjusted portfolio. That's why hedge funds are long short because it's not just about your positive returns, it's about your risk-adjusted returns. What are your drawdowns like? What happens on the day when somebody at the, at the New York Fed says something which spooks the market and they suddenly think, oh my God, the 25 basis points is coming. Um, and the market drops a percent, one and a half percent. We need to be able to make money when, they, when these situations happen. So this is why we need to be able to short. As we've said, it's tricky in an expanding GDP environment um, because in the kind of rising tide lifts all boats situation, if you've shorted a stock in the wrong sector, then even if it's an average stock in the sector, it still is going to go up, which means that you're going to lose on it. In terms of the sizing of situations, we touched on this in the previous slide, um, if you have Y number of longs in your portfolio, then maybe you might say, until the situation has broken, has developed, I'm only going to have half positions on the short side. Clearly, that implies that you're going to need to have twice the number of ideas on the short side. This is tricky, it's difficult. We can do it, but we need to, we need to be really focused on it and prepared to do the work. Sometimes the best you can do is hedge out your market risk or the sector stroke industry risk. It's not a disgrace. Sometimes we have to do that. Now, I haven't even mentioned options. We're going to have two speakers later on, Raj and Chris, who will be going through in great detail how we can utilize options. Obviously, in this situation, we're talking about using put options. Um, and always, as good traders, as good PMs, what we're looking for is we're always looking for the attractive risk reward profile. And of course, the crucial aspect when we throw options into the equation is the timing. These guys are going to talk to you about that later on. So lastly, it's difficult to find good shorts. However, they're extremely necessary. So do not give up. 
be patient. And the great thing is that if you find a few good short candidates each year and you get it right, once the situation breaks, once it develops, what you do is you size up on it, you go with the momentum, and you can make money and great returns very quickly because things fall a lot faster than they go up. So then when you've leaned into that situation, you can size up and your returns will be impressive. Um, and basically, you know, you've got to use these processes, the criteria that we've talked about all the time, um, but certainly, and most satisfyingly as well, when you get good short ideas and they work, not only are the returns fantastic, but it's actually, for some reason, it just feels even more satisfactory. So, thank you very much.